everybody. Welcome to episode number 563 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. We're diving headfirst into the world of RTL design this week. My guest is Rob Canote from Cadence Design Systems, and we're talking all about RTL design and implementation issues facing engineers today. The details of Cadence's Jules RTL Design Studio and the role that artificial intelligence plays in this solution. Also this week, I check out the world's first human brain scale neuromorphic supercomputer. But first, please welcome Rob to Fish Fry. Hi, Rob. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Amelia. It's great to be here. Great. Okay. So what issues do you think engineers have been facing regard to RTL design and implementation, Rob? So, Amelia, I'd say that it's not just a single issue. You know, RTL designers obviously have a, a whole lot on their plate. And, you know, in, in the late 90s, it was common to think that physical designers were the bottleneck to getting a, a design out the door. But that's really started to shift in the 2000s. And especially if you look at modern designs now, functional verification and the functional coding of the RTL has by far eclipsed physical design. And what an RTL designer spends their time on is intimately related to getting a quality product out the door. And so what problems are they facing? I mean, obviously there's a crushing amount of functional coding that has to get done, but a bigger problem that is intertwined there is they're making silicon, they're not making C code. And so the physical realities and how that feeds back to their functional coding is a critical problem for them to understand. And honestly, one that EDA hasn't done a fantastic job bridging. We've introduced a lot of different technologies over the years, all to try to give you know, RTL designers better tools to understand what their design is going to look like when it becomes physical. But they've really all missed the mark, whether it's due to usability or accuracy. RTL designers really haven't had the same types of tools that, say, a C code designer would have, like an IDE. And that's the problem that we set out to solve, to help RTL designers get early, more accurate insights into the physical effects of their functional code, and then allow them to optimize their RTL to get a better product out the door faster. That makes sense. Now, let's talk about this new product that you guys have launched to help with these challenges. Tell me about the Jules RTL Design Studio. Yeah, so we've been working on this product for several years, and it's really been an evolution, I would say. Cadence launched uh, Jules RTL Power Solution a few years back, and what really set it apart from the other RTL Power Solutions out there was this better accuracy because as opposed to the other solutions at the time, it was the only one that had a, a production quality synthesis engine, timer, et cetera. And this is really stronger together attitude. Rather than just having a bunch of smart people off reinventing the wheel, we focused on power and then we used the other industry leading engines that we have at Cadence to deliver the physical prototyping. Now, fast forward to today, that was great for RTL designers to get a better and more accurate insight into power earlier. But power doesn't live in a vacuum, right? If you're going to go make a power fix, there's a really good chance that you might destabilize another aspect of the design. Maybe you increase congestion. Maybe you cause a timing problem. And so RTL designers needed a cockpit that gave them full 360 degree visibility of the whole design space. And that's where Jewel's RTL Design Studio really came from. And that was taking the existing core competency of Jewel's RTL power and then adding on visibility into all the other metrics, power, performance, area, congestion, et cetera. And so rather than, you know, again, just like the original Jules product, we didn't go off and reinvent the wheel. We've got the industry-leading implementation system sitting right there, Innovus. 
And so by leveraging the existing synthesis and place and route and timing capabilities that we have, by investing more into better visualization of the design, better querying, and then partnering with several leading companies out there so that we could truly understand the RTL design environment, truly understand what would make it more useful, et cetera. That's where we're at today. So a product that gives you early accurate estimates of all the metrics the RTL designer needs. It gives very intelligent debugging guidance. So that way you're not just left with what failed, but also why is something failing? And in many cases, what could you do to make it better? It's really an expert system that helps guide the RTL designer to make those edits quickly, confidently, and deliver a better product. Fantastic. Now, what do you think are some of the coolest features of this new design studio? I'm biased, obviously. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. But if I've really got to boil it down to, there's really, you know, I would say two big classes of features that are cool. The first one is our prototyper, right? It's this core engine that takes RTL and turns it into a physical representation that we can then use to figure out what the performance, power, area, congestion are. And, and it's cool for a couple of reasons. One, because we did a really good job working as a team with the other experts inside of Cadence. So that way, when we're creating these prototypes, we're immediately correlating with, you know, any advances that come down the pipe in Anovis or Genus, et cetera. So that way you're always giving the RTL designer predictability and giving the RTL designer accuracy as new advanced node effects come out automatically, this prototyper gets it. And so this way, the RTL designer isn't just chasing their tail because the prototyper said one thing, but the implementation tool said something else. We really created a very easy to use, flexible engine that allows them to scale the runtime that the tool is spending relative to the design state they're in. So early on, they can do super quick iterations to clean up early mismatched collateral, but fix the big gross problems that are out there. And then as the collateral matures, they can spend some more runtime to get increasing fidelity and start doing floor plan optimization and all sorts of different investigations in their RTL and the other collateral to create this optimized RTL. And then when it comes time to hand off, they can crank the accuracy all the way up and deliver perfect correlated results to what production synthesis would. And that way there's no surprises, you know, when they do a handoff to physical. And then the other big cool part about it is what we do once we have the prototype and this intelligent RTL debug assistant. And so it's this expert system that we've built based on the world's leading debuggers out there, AEs and customers and product engineers, looking at each of them, what are the techniques you use? How do you spot something that's bad? What do you do when it's bad? Being able to build on top of all of that knowledge has created a really useful, really productive tool that when working with our early partners, they see a huge leap in productivity, both for senior engineers who have a lot of work on their plate, but also for junior engineers, people who are just getting hired or geographically distributed design teams who can't walk in and, you know, for a whiteboard to figure something out. We've got this tool that helps inform, educate, and helps get better decisions made. That RTL debug assistant comes with radically new graphical user interface, very different from a lot of the other Cadence tools, and it's been highly customized for specifically RTL designers. And it also gives the ability for us to use, say, an existing implementation database. Maybe your place and route team's having a bunch of DRC problems. Rather than spending a few hours in a conference room at a whiteboard drawing pictures to try to figure out what's going on, the RTL designer can immediately cross probe from that DRC database from Innovis back to their RTL and see if maybe a surgical RTL edit could just make the problem go away. So, Rob, AI has been a hot topic for a while in chip design. So how does this new product tie into AI? 
it's impossible to exist in EDA or semiconductors without having one tie into AI or another. Inside of Cadence, we've got a really strong generative AI platform that connects up all sorts of tools across the portfolio. Cerebrus for digital implementation, Virtuoso Studio, Allegro X, Verisium, Optimality, all across the spectrum. We're no exception into that. And so the Jules RTL Design Studio leverages AI instead of Cadence in, in two manner. One, for better design space exploration. And so you think about the end effects that you can have by making changes in the front end, whether it's RTL or floor plan, they're huge, right? It's, it's way bigger impact on the power performance scenario of your end product than what you could do downstream. And so we use the Cerebrus platform to help us better explore the front end design space. And then we leverage the JEDI platform to do a deeper analytics across versions of the design, across previous designs, et cetera, to give the user the ability to do better trend analysis. And leveraging their own data to help improve what they're doing next is a, a huge way to be able to get a better product to market. All right, Rob, it's time for your off the cuff. Now, I know you're from an area of the world that I know very well, and the name fish fry has a special meaning for you. So talk to me about that. Yeah, there is. <laughs> uh, that, that's right, Amelia. So I, I hail from the north woods of Wisconsin, a small town just outside of Chippewa Falls called Osseo, Wisconsin. Fish fries, it's impossible to be a Wisconsinite without enjoying a fish fry. And, you know, I've got to say that it's um, one of those things that it doesn't matter where you end up physically, you can't take the fish fry out of the Wisconsinite. So right now I live on the West Coast of the U.S. up in Oregon, and I'll go out and I'll eat fish at restaurants. And it's just not the same, you know. And so I've spent many years trying to recreate a good Wisconsin fish fry Finally, I've cracked a decent recipe that my family loves. It puts a smile on my face and warm feeling in the belly every time. Fish fries are a beautiful thing that just brings people together. And it's where every time I see your podcast, I'm always smiling about good memories growing up back in Wisconsin. I love it. Well, Rob, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Amelia. Have a great day. Enjoy that fish. <laughs> Have you heard about the world's first human brain scale neuromorphic supercomputer? Recently unveiled at the International Center for Neuromorphic Systems, or ICNS, at Western Sydney University, this neuromorphic supercomputer named Deep South, which will officially go online in April of 2024, will be the first machine ever built that is capable of simulating spiking neural networks at the scale of the human brain. Yeah, that's an estimated 228 trillion synaptic operations per second. Director of ICNS, Professor Andre Van Schaik, explains the monumental nature of Deep South like this. Progress in our understanding of how brains compute using neurons is hampered by our inability to simulate brain like networks at scale. Simulating spiking neural networks on standard computers using GPUs or multi core central processing units or CPUs is just too slow and power intensive. Our system will change that. This platform will progress our understanding of the brain and develop brain skill computing applications in diverse fields, including sensing, biomedical, robotics, space, and large-scale AI applications. So, beyond the sheer performance of Deep South, this supercomputer is also much smaller than other supercomputers and consumes less energy as well because of that spiking neural network approach. It's also scalable, modular, reconfigurable, and uses commercially available hardware. And that reconfigurable part? That comes from FPGAs. 
Those FPGAs actually enable the addition of new neuron models, connectivity schemes, and learning rules, which overcomes limitations seen in other neuromorphic computing systems with custom-designed hardware. Deep South will also be remotely accessible with a front end that allows description of neural models and design of neural networks in Python. This is an important aspect of Deep South because it enables researchers to use the platform without needing detailed knowledge of the hardware configuration. Given all of those benefits, it's quite easy to see how Deep South could be expanded in the future. And the name? Well, that's a cool story too. Deep South pays homage to IBM's True North system, which was one of the first machines to simulate large networks of spiking neurons. And Deep Blue, which was the first computer chess champion. And finally, South is also a nod to its geographical location as well. So if you want even more information about Deep South or Cadence's Jules RTL Design Studio, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And yeah, I know it's called X now, but whatever. <laughs> you can also follow my personal account at Amelia D1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EE Journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of December 22nd, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.